Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Doug. I'm a preservation archaeologist with Archaeology Southwest. Welcome to tonight's Archaeology Cafe. The way this event usually works is our speaker speaks for about half an hour to 40 minutes, mm -hmm. and then we'll open the floor to questions. Uh, tonight's speaker is Peggy Nelson from a professor of anthropology at the School of uh, what is it? I completely lost Human it. Evolution. Human evolution and social, social change. Aha. <laughs> Uh, who will be speaking on one of my favorite topics tonight, uh, the archaeology of the uh, ancient members. So, Peggy, if you would mind. Thanks. Of course, I want to start off by thanking all of you for coming to, to hear about people and houses in the members. I appreciate that you're here. I'm also going to, which you're always told not to do when you, when you speak to a group, I'm going to apologize in advance. Uh, <coughs> I have a cold, so when I do that, <coughs> I apologize. I hate that sound, but... <coughs> I won't be able to stop. I'll try to keep, uh, yeah, to try to keep that to a minimum. I want to acknowledge before I begin uh, speaking that what I'm going to talk about tonight um, uh, comes from the work of a lot of people who have been interested in membrane archaeology uh, for decades. The work that I do or have done in the membrane is a collaboration um, first for almost 20 years with uh, Dr. Michelle Hagman who's also at Arizona State University, uh, and um, more recently with um, Karen Schollmeyer, who is with uh, Archaeology Southwest now. Uh, they've stolen her away from me. Uh, yeah, so uh, you're in my loss. I want to start off, I know I said I was going to talk about houses, but the first thing I want to talk about is what I call noticing, because it's in noticing that all of this started in the first place for me. Uh, thinking about houses and people and so on. You've probably had this experience. I'm walking down the sidewalk in our neighborhood with my husband, and I say, wow, look at that amazing tree. That is a beautiful tree. That's a new tree. It's never, I've never seen that tree before. And he'll say, that tree's been there for 10 years. <laughs> and, I, and I've never noticed it. You know, you're driving together in the car, and you notice a building, or you notice a new landscaping, but it's not new at all. It's been there for a very long time. That noticing and not noticing is really what got me started uh, in thinking about houses, because this is what happened about 15 years ago. I was <coughs> working on an excavation on a classic Membrace village, and if you know Membrace at all, you know that it's a cobble masonry, clusters of room blocks that form a village. People moved into them about a thousand years ago, uh, and uh, lived in villages on and off and moving around the landscape for about 130 years and then the villages, the classic numbers villages were mainly depopulated. <coughs> in excavating in one of those villages called Pagewell Village in the eastern Membrace area, uh, I noticed that um, where the plaster had come off the wall, so the walls are stone and then they're plastered, where the plaster had come off the wall, there was just a mono, a hole useful, grooved mono just sitting there in the wall. And I thought, why would somebody use a useful mono as a wall stone? In 1979, uh, I was a graduate student. I was just working on my dissertation. And I had the opportunity, if I was given the opportunity to go to Guatemala and live in a Maya community for four months. Uh, so my, I'm sure my dissertation committee thought I was crazy for just putting my, at that time we actually used pens and paper, putting my pen down, going down to Guatemala for four months to live in a Maya community. But I was very interested, it was a subsistence farming community, and I was writing about membranes, subsistence farmers, and I really wanted to see it, see what it was I was writing about. So I, I went down there, and one of the things I became very interested in is, uh, how ground stone, grinding stones are made and, um, and distributed. And so I, um, not an apprentice myself, I sort of made myself a nuisance uh, to one of the um, men in the community who made grinding stones. I spent a lot of time with him, watching him make grinding stones, carrying stone for him, uh, recording um, what were the deposits or the sites that he created in making that. And one of the things I learned that's relevant to I know I'm circling all over the place here, but I'm going to come in on something. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I learned from working with him is that it takes a long time to make a good metate and mono set. 
And then the women in the community were very, very possessive of their set. In that Maya community, women spent between four and six hours every day grinding. And they did not, even when there were multiple women in the household, and there usually were, they did not let each other touch their grinding stones. Uh, because they was, it was their set, it was fitted to them. So then seeing this motto in the wall made me wonder why anybody would do that. And uh, so then I started getting interested in what else did people, what did people put in the fabric of their houses? What, what, why did they do it? What did they put there? And if they were putting things in their houses to mark them in some way as special, what was happening at the end of those occupations? What, what were they doing? Were they also closing their rooms in any kinds of special ways with special treatments? And all those two things related. So that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. Uh, there's a, plenty of literature about pre-Hispanic treatment of houses and how that conveys symbolic or metaphoric meaning. Um, there's mention in the ethnographies of people uh, doing dedication ceremonies uh, up to houses, Dan dances before a house is uh, finally occupied. There is plenty of reference to closing, especially ritual structures um, in ethnographies. Uh, Roger Anion here in the back um, and Daryl Krill have written um, very nicely about the kinds of uh, closure ceremonies that occur in, in uh, ritual structures in the Membrace area in Big Kivas. The most um, attention to house dedication comes in the literature of Mesoamerica, uh, where Mesoamerican archaeologists, especially working in the Maya area, have extensively described archaeological and ethnographic uh, recordings of people dedicating houses and closing houses. In fact, people there liken the creation of a house to the human life cycle. Houses are sold when they're created, and they're desold when they're uh, finally um, uh, uh, not occupied anymore. But in Mesoamerica, different from the Southwest, these are on sites that are occupied for centuries. The house is built, rebuilt, 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 very, very different from what we see in the Southwest. So is that Mesoamerican sense of insolment and desolment, is that relevant to the Southwest? Is, is it even relevant uh, to think about people um, giving special treatment to their houses? So that's the question I wanted to look at. Are there special ways that people treat houses in the membranes when they're created and when they're, um, and when they're left? I'm going to make one more digression. Now I've told you about being in the Maya area. I've told you about being with my husband walking down the street. I'm going to make one more digression because I'm going to bring this all back together. Um, that digression is to talk a little bit about the 20 years of research that I've been doing in the Membrace that is focused on understanding the end of the classic Membrace period. So Membrace villages are formed about AD 1000. They're occupied, people move in and out of them, but they're occupied up until about 11.30. And then 11.30, throughout the Membrace region, all of those villages are either completely or nearly completely depopulated. And what my research for 20 years of my 40-year career of working in the Membrace uh, region has focused on trying to understand what happens at the end of that. Because when I was a graduate student, we were told and we understood that there was a kind of mysterious disappearance. And it's kind of fun um, to think, and museums use this imagery, it's kind of fun to think, well, you know, the pottery went away and the people left the villages and they just disappeared and it's really mysterious. Uh, so the work that we were doing in Membrace was, and it's um, in the area on your map there, this shows you the Membrace region, and over to the right-hand side is the eastern Membrace. That's along the Rio Grande. In the center is the Membrace Valley. On the left is, is the Upper Gila. Upper Gila is where Archaeology Southwest is uh, now working. Um, but all of the work that I've been doing over the last, since the early 1980s, has been in the eastern Membrace area. My dissertation work was in the Membrace Valley. Um, over in the eastern um, Membrace area, <coughs> we were trying to trace do we, can we see what happens with people when they leave those villages? And we were able to show that they, while about 40% of the people who lived in the Eastern Membrace region left the region, and probably 80% or 90% of the people in Membrace Valley migrated away, 
Some people remained, and what they did was scatter onto the landscape into smaller settlements, and within 70 to 100 years come back together in villages. But because they stopped making membrane pottery, we had s equated pottery with people, and we had said, oh, they disappeared, they're gone. They weren't gone at all. They just changed their tradition and used movement, used movement in order to be able to remain in a region that they had occupied or to move to another region nearby, uh, but use movement as a way to sustain an adaptation. So when you look at the archaeological record of the Southwest, and uh, Tessie Naranjo is probably the most quoted um, uh, native person who's talked about this, but when we look at the archaeological and the historic and the ethnographic record, we know that movement was critically important to a, a successful adaptation for corn agriculturalists in the Southwest. Now, I bring this up because movement really characterizes the Southwest, whereas stability characterizes the Maya area in Mesoamerica. And so the models from Mesoamerica about house installment and house retirement, all of that, may just not be relevant. Uh, and so I wanted to look into that. How relevant are they? What are people doing in the Membrace area? So let's look at some houses. Let's go inside. The map shows you um, in the eastern Membrace area uh, four sites, Roadmap and Phyllis, those are post-classic villages. They were occupied from sometime in the mid to late 1200s and into, we think, about 14, 1450. So those are post-classic. They're, they're both very different. Uh, Phyllis has a very southern um, ceramic assemblage. Roadmap has a southern and, and very much a northern, actually Mesa Verde-like ceramic assemblage mixed together. Kind of an odd site, Roadmap. Um, but they're both large villages, and they became two of the sites in our pilot. We started just with a pilot of looking at four of the sites we've excavated there. The two in the post-classic, and then the other two, Flying Fish and Pagewell, those are classic period sites. So they were occupied from 1000 to 1130. We picked those because we've done fairly extensive excavations on them. Altogether, between the four sites, we were able to use 35 different rooms. Uh, where we had documented what were in the walls of those rooms and what was plastered into the floors and so on. So these were all excavated after I sort of had that aha uh -huh, noticing that there were whole grinding stones in walls. And it was worth looking behind the plaster to see what else people were putting into their walls. So what I want to talk about tonight is just our pilot. The pilot was done um, with a graduate student, Will Russell, and an undergraduate student, Rebecca Harkness. We together collaborated on the ideas that I'm going to talk about here. I also want to say that, uh, emphasize for you the importance of preservation and protection. In the Eastern Membrace area, in contrast to the Membrace Valley, there's almost no bulldozing. There's some hand looting, but there are lots and lots of sites there that have not been looted. And so the walls have been protected, the floors have been protected, the fill, so we can look at what happens with the closure of rooms, that's been protected. It wouldn't, we wouldn't have been able to do this research if we hadn't been able to work on sites where the site had been protected and preserved by the landowners. And this is a wonderful thing about the Eastern Membrace area. As a region, every landowner I've encountered, and I've gone up and down several of the drainages that are leading to the Rio Grande, the landowners care, and they protect their sites, and they care what's in it, and they want to learn more about them, and they're very involved. The Ted Turner and the Turner Foundation is you know, one of the big ranches that we've worked, uh, where we've worked, and they have been fantastic about site preservation. Um, <clears throat> The other is the A Spear Ranch, which is owned by a, a group of 10 families, and all of them are completely committed to, to site preservation. They have it written into their agreement that they will not build anything until they have uh, uh, an, uh, a survey done uh, uh, of the areas for their houses, <coughs> which has been fantastic. Okay, so finally, whew, all that prelude. Now I'm down to it. What did people put into their houses? Interestingly, three quarters of all of the houses that we looked at had something either stuck in the walls, whole objects stuck in the walls, or plastered into the floor. Not on the floor, but actually in the floor, or just as you pull the floor up, it's just sitting right there 
kind of stuck on the underside of the floor. The most common items that people put in their walls and on their floors, into their floors, are grinding stones and projectile points. A third of all the rooms had grinding stones in their walls. Matates even. Matates will be used as foundation stones. Whole ones that could still be used. 42%, so quite a few rooms, had projectile points stuck in their walls or plastered into their floors. Let me give you a couple of examples. This is the one that, one of the ones I love, and it's from that site where I first not the, noticed the grinding stones in the walls. And I'm wondering now if I'd have ever noticed this had I not noticed the mono in the wall. There are two rooms in, in a, the several, page well has about four room blocks. We excavated in two of the room blocks. We excavated two adjacent rooms that were connected by a doorway. The threshold of the doorway was a matate turned upside down. A whole matate, it was hardly, it had been used, but there was plenty left in that matate, but it had been turned upside down and became the threshold of the doorway. And so every day as people moved back and forth through their house, they either stepped on their matate or they stepped over their matate. Their grandma's matate, their mother's matate, their great grandmother's, I don't know but they used a granny stone, um, and um, <coughs> that particular room had three monos also stuck in walls. Uh, that was a classic room. I'll, I'll mention a post-classic room um, where there were, um, in, in uh, road, in road map, the walls are preserved up to six, roughly six feet, uh, so about uh, two meters. The walls were preserved. It was, it's an amazing site. And uh, there are lots of vents that connect rooms to each other. There are vents down at the floor level and there are vents sort of at eye level. And in one particular wall there were two vents and in each vent there was a mono that formed one side of the vent. Again, I wanted to include a photograph for you, but it doesn't look like anything. I got out all the wall photographs and I looked at them and I went through them and it, it, it's the side of a mono, but it just looks like any other rock, but when you have a good look at it, you see it's a mono. The picture I did include for you is one that's quite odd. It's, it's, this is the only occurrence of it, but it's something that's visible to you. Um, it's, this, it's the bottom picture on the, on the second page, um, and it's a mortar. It's a stone mortar, and it, um, what you're looking at there is the foundation stones of a wall. So it was one of the foundation stones of a wall. When we first saw the mortar, it was, uh, there was a hole through it. So we just thought, okay, well, it's a worn out mortar. Someone brought it in, put it there. <clears throat> when we looked at it from the other side, we went to the, and dug down the outside of the wall to look at it. Somebody, there was about this much um, stone still remaining. That, that was a useful mortar. It wasn't that deep. You can see, you may, can maybe see from the picture, it's not a very deep mortar. So it wasn't that it got too deep either. Someone had gone to the underside and with a hammer stone had pecked that thing out until they made a hole through the back. Put it as a foundation stone, set that mono in there, and we think plastered it over because it's a foundation stone for the walls and the walls are plastered. So they may have left that open, they may have, may have been a little cubby hole, why they put a hole in it then I don't know. Um, <coughs> but that was an odd one. That was one of the uh, grinding stone combinations that we have. So vents, doorways, walls, all had grinding stones in them. I mentioned that f over 40% of the, of the uh, rooms had projectile points either stuck in the walls or plastered into the floors. We found them um, in, a lot of, uh, in a lot of different places. Um, you have to really look closely if you want to find projectile points stuck in the wall. There were probably many more than we found. Uh, but 15 of the 35 rooms that we looked at had projectile points stuck in the walls. One of the things that's interesting to me about the projectile points in the walls is that over half of them, I, I, uh, if you flip to the next page, I, I just have a picture there of someone with projectile points on their fingers, so you can... <coughs> these, are, these are cryptocrystalline projectile points, uh, chert and chalcedony, but over 50% of the projectile points were obsidian. An obsidian is a glass, so it's brittle, and 
while it will pierce an animal probably better than a cryptocrystalline point, if you shoot it wrong and miss the animal, it's going to break. It's going to break when it hits the ground. It's very fragile. So a lot of people, or not a lot, but several people have suggested, and Kathy Cameron and I um, have plans to write a paper on this, um, that obsidian points may have been produced primarily for ritual. And to find that over 50% of the points that were in walls were obsidian, I just thought was interesting. So why did people put grinding stones and projectile points in their walls? Uh, a lot of different reasons, but projectile points and grinding stones represent the objects that are most central to people's success, most central to them provisioning their families. Corn grinding, getting deer, or other animals but in the membrane probably mainly deer. Now we have to consider, I've got sort of four reasons I want to suggest, and I'd love to hear from you at the end what you think you know, this, all this might represent because I need ideas. But here are some that I have. One, they, could have, they actually could have been things that were thrown away. We don't really know why people always throw things away. We think they're not going to throw things away until they're broken. But that may not be the case. They may have been thrown away and people picked them up off the ground, just like any other rock and dirt, and incorporated them into their walls. So it's possible. It could be that people are putting grinding stones and points into their walls in order to be able to sort of symbolically constitute their household. Our household represents people who grow plants and people who hunt. And that's our household, and we're constituting it as we build our house. So that's the second possibility. The third is kind of a more ritual interpretation. In the second case, I'm just saying they're constituting their house. In the third case, it, with ritual, I think that there may be ritual that ensures prosperity that's involved with for creating a house. And that ritual that ensures prosperity involves either or both grinding stones and projectile points. We know that uh, ceremonies involving grinding are very, very common in the Pueblos, and also those involving hunting are common in the Pueblos. So uh, that's another possibility. And then finally, one thing that um, Will Russell suggested is that um, in some ethnographies, projectile points are identified as protection against witchcraft. Now, I caution against using straight information from, from ethnographies in that way. But um, they may be indication, is, uh, the, the offerings in the houses may be indications of some way of protecting the household. Whatever the reason, these objects, these projectile points and grinding stones became part of the fabric of the house. They became part of the being of the house. And it wasn't just grinding stones and projectile points. I just want to mention a few things. They were rare, but there were 16 other things that were put into walls or plastered into floors. Shaped stones, pieces of wood that were carved, flat pieces of wood that were carved. Pe people had various names for them and, um, it, that were ritual, but I don't actually know what they are, but they're carved uh, flat pieces of wood. Fossils, carved bones, pendants. There was a stone pipe stuck in a wall. And these are all, remember, <coughs> pla plastered over. So this is something that people are doing when they create their house when they put together the fabric of their house and <clears throat> plastering it over. One of the most interesting uh, pieces that we found in the fabric of a house, besides that mortar and, and mono, is this, what we call the dagger, which is at the bottom of the page where the projectile points are. That's a pretty big dagger. That's a selenite dagger. There were two of them. They were stacked on top of each other. And they were plastered into the floor of a post-classic Pueblo, at Phyllis Pueblo. And you could not tell that they were there. It wasn't, it, it, at first I thought they must have put those in at the end, dug the hole in the floor and put it in. But there wasn't a patch there. And the floor was just flat as can be. But as we took the floor out, and it was very thick. The floor was very, very thick. These two selenite daggers were sitting on top of each other, plastered solidly into that floor. So with all the variety we found, we think not only that grinding stones and projectile points have a special place in the formation of a house, but also that it may have mattered 
in some cases, not so much what you put into a house when it was built, but that you put something in there. Because three quarters of the houses have something in their fabric. So that's kind of interesting um, and something I didn't expect at all. I expected to see that in places in the south, in the south especially around the Southwest where people move very frequently, the house may not have mattered that much. Its creation, its closure may not have mattered that much. So I, wasn't, I was expecting this to see when I went looking that those monos that I saw really were pretty rare and I hadn't missed a lot, but I in fact had missed a lot, uh, not noticed. So just continuing with the house now, it's been built, people have lived in it. Now when they leave, what do they do? How do they treat it? There are lots, there are many, many practices and many objects involved in the closure of houses. Some of them are very uh, dramatic or elaborate. Elaborate is probably a better word. Some of them are very elaborate and some of them are very subtle. I want to just t uh, talk to you about some of the more elaborate ones because they're quite interesting. And if you flip the next page, this is one, of, well, all of these are interesting. This is a classic room. It's this page right here. This is a classic room. <clears throat> in a room block at Flying Fish Village, and right across, it's Flying Fish Village is called Flying Fish because there are, are uh, panels, many, many panels of petroglyphs right across the creek from this uh, village. Um, and one of them is, a, is actually a cliff swallow. And the people who originally recorded or thought, saw it called it a flying fish. And so the, how the site has been called Flying Fish. They named a well there, Flying Fish Well, and so we pretty much had no choice but to call the site Flying Fish. Before I go into the detail of this, I want to say that 30 of these 35 rooms, so these are all the rooms we excavated on these four sites. We, we included them all in the sample. We didn't just pick ones that had evidence of closure. 30 of the 35 rooms had evidence of closure, so quite a few. So here's room 35 at Flying Fish Village. As people moved out of this room, they sealed two passageways. There were two passageways from this room into adjacent rooms. They sealed them with big slabs of sandstone that they brought into the site. There wasn't any sandstone near there, so they had to go some distance to get that. And they put those slabs there and sealed that. And then they went to the hearth. You see the big hearth in the center of the room there. Went to the hearth and punched the bottom out completely. Down to an ash layer that was below the floor. So you can see the ash layer now uh, through the floor of the hearth. So the hearth was then just um, made inoperable. Then they placed four matates, six monos, six whole vessels, seven projectile points, several beads, several pendants, and a few other small things, and a badger skull uh, in the corner, the badger skull you can see is in the very far left-hand corner. It just looks like a little blob, but that's where the badger skull was. If you want to know direction there, I believe that is northwest. All the objects that were placed on the floor, before they were placed on the floor, were rubbed in color. So yellow ochre was ground up, red ochre was ground up, and either turquoise or chryscoia was ground up for the tur turquoise color, and every object was rubbed with a color. And they were all placed together, so all the red rubbed objects were together, all the blues were together, all the yellows were together. And then ground ochre and ground turquoise or chryscoia was then scattered over the whole room in just those sections. So the sections don't, and you can see the sections don't overlap each other. It's very interesting. You don't get the blue running into the red. You don't get the red running into the yellow. They were separated from each other. These are some of the major colors that are used now in the Rio Grande Pueblos and associated with different directions. Um, I'd like to say oh, this matches this particular uh, group or that particular group, but it doesn't match anything. It's just that the same kinds of colors are used. And then the room just stops being used. They don't fill it. They don't knock it down. It's just left like that. There's quite a lot of the ochre and turquoise. So in excavating down, there was a layer of, I'd say, almost 10 centimeters of color 
in those areas uh, of the room. And you can see there a matate, there, uh, this is one of the matates that was on the floor of the room, and it's had turquoise rubbed all through it. And it may have even been where the turquoise was ground on this matate. But all the matates had color in them. Depending on where they were in the room, they had different colors. Again, interesting for that room, grinding stones and projectile points, right? There were 10 grinding stones and seven projectile points that were part of that. Lots of other objects too, but those pesky projectile points and grinding stones just keep coming up. Uh, in a post-classic room, and I don't have an illustration of this one, I just want to tell you about it because it's quite interesting. There's an occupation, there's four occupations that overlap each other. They're just remodelings of a room. And when the final room of the series of occupations, it's in a room block. This is a post-classic site that had three separate room blocks, and we excavated in two of them. This is a room in one of those room blocks. <coughs> At the end of the occupation, people chopped out the floor entirely. We can see the chop marks along the wall. They just chopped the floor entirely away. While the roof was still there, so they had to have taken the pieces of the floor up through the roof. Then, they took out the center post. Again, I don't know how they kept the roof standing, but they did, and, and you'll see why in a minute. The roof was left standing, but they took out the center post, filled it with soil and ash, took a whole beautiful pestle, stuck it into the center post, and then two projectile points, there we are with grinding stones and projectile points again, Two projectile points, put them on where the floor had been, and lowered the roof down so it sits exactly, its, its bottom, so the ceiling sits exactly where the top of the floor would have been if they hadn't cut it out. It seals in that pestle and the two projectile points. The last um, example of closure I want to talk about is this one, where you can see uh, someone squatted down in a room. And then there's a picture below. This is a very also elaborate uh, closure uh, process. I mentioned when I was talking about the sample at the beginning that we had two post-classic sites, but they're very different. One is, has a northern and southern assemblage. The other has a southern assemblage. Uh, they are built very differently. One of them has enclosed plazas. The other looks more like just a collection of room blocks. Um, but there's something they both had in common, and that's this chopping out of the floor. So this room where you see the woman on her knees there scraping away, and I'll explain what that is in a minute, um, but this is a little diagram. That's Karen Schollmeyer, by the way, if you haven't met her. Uh, that's Karen. She was running the excavation at this site, um, and she made this drawing. So uh, let me t walk you through the drawing. <clears throat> at the end of the occupation, people cho chopped out the floor entirely removed it, just like they had on the other um, post-classic Pueblo. The house had four vents in three walls, and those were filled with <laughs> plaster. All the vents were filled with plaster. Two of them were on one wall, the west wall, and that west wall had a fresh plaster put over it. And that's what you're looking at is the west wall, and if you tip this toward the light, you'll see all kinds of ridges in that plaster. And that's because those are finger marks. We could see the finger marks as people had made deep impressions on that plaster, leaving the remnants of their fingerprints all across that wall. I've never seen that before. Um, <clears throat> and we're sure that that had to be done at the end, one, because the vents were closed up, but also because it would not have remained if people had been living in the room, rubbing up against the walls. Uh, those fingerprints would never uh, have survived. So they did that. And then they, um, because there was no hearth in the room anymore, they actually made a hearth from jar sherds. They took big jar sherds and formed them in as a hearth, even with a bottom to the hearth. The jar sherds were all from different jars. We were hoping, oh, fantastic, we'll reconstruct it. But no, they're different jars. They put, ash, they put ash in it. We don't think they ever, although there's some sooty on the jar shirts, we don't think that it's not, doesn't look consistent like they started a fire. And they certainly didn't start a fire hot enough to make ash. So they put ash in the hearth, 
and then they sealed it over with plaster. There's no floor there, remember. There's just this plug of plaster. We, we thought it was just a plug of plaster. We pulled it up, and there's this shirred hearth. And then they covered the floor area, where the floor had been, with crushed up, ye some, crushed up yellow substance. It's, it's probably a mixture of ochre and silt. So it's mixed together, and there's a thick layer, a couple centimeters thick, of that sprinkled over the whole thing. Not walked on, because we don't see it patted down. It's just sprinkled over the whole thing. <clears throat> and then they partially filled it, maybe about 3 quarters of a meter with soil, and put in a severed antelope head. Now Karen was excavating this, and she's a faunal specialist, and she was uh, very clear that this is a severed head, not a skull. That is, it's not a, a bony object that was put in here. This was a fresh object because the neck vertebra were still intact. You can see when she drew it, she shows the neck vertebra there, just so we remember that. So a severed head of an antelope was put there. Then a little while later, and I'm purposely being vague, because I don't know how much later, more fill was put in, and another antelope severed head, ex exactly the same kind of severing as the previous one, was put on top of that one. And then sometime later, quite a lot of fill, probably close to a meter of fill was put in, and another antelope head was put in, but not right over, it was, it's over to the side a little bit. Now I mention these details because I think, I think it has to be the same people putting those antelope heads in there. They could have done it all within a day. But, the t and the two that are right above one another was separated with maybe half a, uh, or three quarters of a meter of fill. Those could have been done close in time. But the one that's much higher up is not quite in the right place. It's not quite lined up with the other two. And I'm wondering if people came back to the site, the same people came back to the site and did this, same kind of offering in order to close um, and dedicate that room. So maybe return visitation. What else did people put into rooms? There were 37 different objects that people put in rooms at closure. So tremendous variety. There were fossils and bird wings and crystals and carved bones and pendants and ground stone and projectile points and all of those kinds of things. Whole vessels, beads, and projectile points were the most common things, but there were lots and lots of things, and as you could see from the examples I gave you, lots of different treatments. So while 30 of the 35 rooms have closure, so we think closure was important, we think that the form of the closure is less important than that people actually do the closure on those structures. Finally, we wanted to have a look at whether or not there were some rooms that were really special rooms that were both uh, given objects when they were first formed and were closed. How many rooms were there uh, in which both were done? And actually, 62%. So quite a few rooms were both, we could call it dedicated, although I'm ca careful about that. We, objects were put into their fabric. They were special in that way when they were created, and those same rooms were closed. Not all of them, so we have rooms that were just had objects put in them when they were built, and we have other rooms that were just closed and that didn't have objects put in them when they were built. So those things are not tightly connected. It doesn't seem like there were a set of shared uh, practices about exactly how you had to do this, but we know that using objects in relation to houses to create some sort of special identities for those houses uh, was important. <clears throat> Just to close, I want to go back to um, where I was rambling for you in that prelude uh, and return to this idea of mobility. We think that this pilot has showed us that although people moved a lot, the house was made theirs by incorporating their objects into it into its fabric when it was begun. So that was important, even though people were moving a lot. We also think that even though people moved a lot, closing their houses in sometimes complex, elaborate ways and sometimes simple ways 
sometimes simply by putting an object on the floor and giving it, transforming it from being part of the ongoing day-to-day -day world to being part of this special dedicatorial world by putting some kind of pigment on it. Uh, back to the second page, I have an ax there just to show you. There's an ax, and if it were just sitting on the floor, we might think, oh, well, okay, they just um, abandoned it on the floor or when they left because something was odd about it. But this one's been transformed from its form when it was in use to a form that has to do with the house and its closure by the use of both blue pigment and yellow pigment on it. Um, and this is actually how we went about identifying some of the objects in the first place. So we think that houses had some enduring value for the people who built them and left them that is ongoing, maybe even by revisiting. And then that was pretty rare, but we may, there, there were several cases of it, and I only mentioned one. Some of the rooms were special in houses from the very start to the very end, but not very many, only, only six of them. Um, uh, sorry, only 62% um, of them, but still, some of them were special, some were not. And we don't know why some were special and some were not. Um, in, in every way, to us, they look very much like regular residences. And then finally, uh, dedication and closure, although we see them commonly, that doesn't seem to be a, 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 a very prescribed way in which people were supposed to dedicate and which way they were supposed to close their rooms, but instead there were a lot of different ways as long as there was some kind of, um, of activity done in those domains. So this work, we hope, contributes to a whole literature on landscapes of meaning, the importance of place, by looking at the how the house is brought into being and is actively made part of a household and a community and then is brought out of being and closed with, as the community closes its own use of that place. Remembering that the things people were doing, the things they were putting in their houses when they built them, the things that they were doing to close their houses were not visible when they were done because they closed their house down. They let lower the roof, they put in fill. Uh, those things are not visible to others walking around the landscape, but they're known to them. And we think that that kind of knowledge Marking living, marking retirement is very much like marking people. Uh, so the connection between people and houses that we've seen in the Mesoamerican cases, we think, is important in the Southwest and just hasn't been explored very deeply and hopefully we'll be able to continue to do more of this. Well, thank you very much for your time. The artifacts that were incorporated into the construction of the houses, are they roughly contemporaneous, at least in archaeological age, um, with, the, with the structures, or are they earlier? Right. Yeah, uh, the grinding stones look like classic period grinding stones. On the other hand, there's not a great deal of difference between the previous late pit, the grinding stones of the previous late pit house period and the, and the classic period. Um, now, in the reorganization phase, by the time, sorry, in the post-classic, by the time we get to post-classic, Matates are pretty much um, slab matates, and so um, they're not that te they're somewhat temporally diagnostic, but on the scale that we're talking about, and which would be um, less than a century, it's that's hard to say. Projectile point. There's never been a good projectile point <laughs> typology, um, and uh, I will say there are also lots of sherds in walls. We didn't count them. We count the sherds to be chinking, so, uh, like chinking, rather than um, like whole projectile points. Putting a whole projectile point in a wall just for chinking, that would be like trying to get them out of the market or something, I don't know. <laughs> uh, quick question, <coughs> what are the dates for the post-classic? Uh, from the middle of the 1200s <coughs> to sometime in the early to middle 1400s. And okay. again, the sites are occupied in that time frame. We don't know exactly when they're occupied. The ceramics for the post-classic in that region um, endure for very long periods. So it doesn't, they don't help us very much. The ceramics place it in the period middle of the 1200s to middle of the 1400s, but that's as tight as I can get. I don't actually think the sites were occupied for 200 years. 62% uh, six, of the rooms had been both opened and closed. Mm -hmm. Of the remainder, 
to what extent are those cases where you're confident that a room had not been open or not been closed versus simply not being able to tell? Yeah, that's a really good question. And in the longer version of this paper, we talk about that. We talk about a lot of different ways that we know ethnographically, both in Mesoamerica and in the Southwest, that there are things that people did that would never show up. For example, the two wooden, carved wooden pieces we found in the wall, we were just lucky that we found those because the wall had been tightly sealed with adobe and these were stuck in between some stones and they didn't get wet. Um, but normally that they would not have survived. So there are plenty of feathers, uh, plants, um, skins, all fabric, all kinds of things people could have put in. So um, <clears throat> we have, I would argue that the numbers I'm telling you are low. So it's at least three quarters, yeah, uh, uh, were, had something put in. At least 62% had both op uh, uh, closure and, uh, sorry, uh, uh, well, dedication and closure. Uh, while you w were mentioning the presence of or or personal ornaments such as beads and pendants in the closing, did you encounter those as part of the opening ceremonies? Yeah, well, um, some beads and pendants are plastered into floors. Okay. Yeah, and it doesn't look like that. We were careful to d distinguish between ones that had a patch put over them so that it could have been put in at the end versus ones that were incorporated into the floor. And so beads and pendants are um, both in floors and in walls. I, I, pro I doubt, if I go back to the notes, I probably it's rare to see a bead in a wall just because it's hard to see them. Um, wh however, one of the things that we do in wall clearing is we pull the plaster off. We take all the plaster separate from everything else and we screen it. So that if we had, and I don't have the table of notes right here, um, if we had found a bead in a wall, that would have been how we found it in the plaster. What about bracelets? No bracelets were found. Yeah, but I also want to say that in the Eastern Membrace area, bracelets are really rare. Really, really rare. Is there any long-term oral history from today's Pueblo people that would explain this? Or do they have customs in their house building where they bury things in this manner? <laughs> There's not um, that I know of detailed documentation of what people put into the fabric of their houses. There is discussion of various kinds of ceremonies that people have associated with building houses and closing houses. And um, I imagine it would be an interesting research project to get a better understanding of what objects are associated with those ceremonies. Because it may be that some of those objects are then placed in, into um, houses. One of the interesting things for, um, for the classic rooms is that if we think of the house, if the house really is being treated like a person, in the classic period, people were buried with those black and white bowls, uh, classic memories, black and white bowls, in, over their face usually with a kill hole in it. We didn't find anything like that in a room. No closure had black and white bowls associated with it. We did find black and white bowls sitting on the floor of rooms, but we didn't interpret those as closures. We were being pretty strict about what a closure was. We did have a room with two black and white bowls and a jar sitting on the floor, which I think probably is closure, but um, we didn't count it because we couldn't be sure. In the Tucson Basin, uh, one of the reasons that we see a closure of, of pit structures in this general time period is oftentimes related to the probably the death of an individual in a household, mm -hmm. and it we can oftentimes <coughs> tie the abandonment or the, the transformation of a whole household to probably the, the death. We, don't, we can't say that this individual died and we can tie it to that household, but they look like mortuary-related rituals. Uh -huh. So are you seeing this as, as something that's happening on the household level, or is this the entire community that's shutting down? And then you mentioned mob mobility. Is this right. a, a transition to a new right. state on the landscape? Um, well, so the two parts to what you said, I'm going to go back and say that um, we, there isn't, is not a pattern of a human burial uh, associated with these closures in a consistent way. So there are some human 
burials. We do not excavate them. We don't, in our work, don't excavate human burials. So there are some associated with these rooms, but uh, the, for example, the, the ones that I showed you, the dramatic ones that are illustrated for you, there were no human burials associated with those. Um, the other thing I want to say about it, the explanation of burial, um, Bill Walker's talked a lot about this, about ritual closures and reasons why ritual closures happen, having to do with witchcraft and having to do with death of an important family member. I just don't yet know that there are any definitive um, <coughs> arguments that it, without association of a burial, definitive arguments that that's happening. So you, you have that in the Holocom region. We don't have that. Um, so I don't, I, I think that this closure, uh, because it's so common, uh, I think that the closure, would I say 30 of 35 rooms have closure? And it's in the classic period and in the post classic. <laughs> Um, I think it has to do with that the house is part of, becomes part of a living community and uh, when, the, when people move away from the community they need to shut down the life of the house uh, and whether that's because someone died or because something bad happened there, I, I'm not sure that all these um, uh, community closures are about bad things. I think they can be about uh, all kinds, they can be for all kinds of reasons that have to do with the perception people have about a landscape around which they're free to move. And in Mimbrace, there's a lot of, uh, I think, potential freedom for movement. Did I address your question, Bill? Okay. More of a thought than a question. Um, going to the other end, to the opening of a house, what about, I can't, I can't imagine how you would test it, but you have a an older couple moving into a new house versus you have a newlywed couple moving into a new house starting a new family. Right. And that would, you know, make make sense from a right. lot of cultures. Right. Um, th that's a very good point. Uh, it would be fascinating to be able to link the um, use of, especially from my point of view, especially grinding stones and projectile points, um, the use of those in houses uh, according to the age of the people, or the age class of the people building the house. Um, and I'm guessing, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining that the grinding stones are there because they're important to the family. They're, they're almost like heirlooms. People keep them, they use them, they put them into their houses, and if they move from over here to here, they bring the grinding stone that grandma had, and they put it there, and then it stays there. Um, now, interestingly, they didn't pick up grandma, too. We don't see that and, and move her, um, but they certainly put a lot of useful grinding stones around. And so I imagine that those have something to do with referencing their family and constituting the household. So it's more than just building a house to constitute a household. It's putting things in the fabric of it that constitute the household. And so it would be fascinating to know what are the age classes of these people building these? Or, and I didn't look at this, I'm gonna go back and do this now because as I'm talking to you, I'm thinking about it. Um, are the grinding stones in houses that have more connected rooms? So are they more extended households? Or are they in the houses that are more contained, that don't have doorways through, have a single room or, uh, or two rooms? Or, or add a room or, right, yeah. I have one quick one. Um, on the blue-green material that was that was sprinkled over the, the matate, mm -hmm. is there any chance at all that could be copper, copper sulfate? Um, I think it's a little too granular for that. Okay. Uh, it's, it, it looks exactly like turquoise ground, pounded and ground up. It just would, I said criscoia because it would be easier to grind criscoia than turquoise because it's more friable. Um, but we haven't tested it, so anything's possible. We tried to test the, the, the floor that, had, that was recreated after it was cut out with all the yellow uh, soil and uh, uh, it created a few centimeters deep layer. That uh, We tried to get that tested to figure out whether that was a substance, but it's not. It's a mixture of substances. Ochre with something, probably silt, silt something. I'd love to talk about that, about that yeah, later. Yeah. Any other questions tonight? Alrighty, Peggy, thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you for letting me come and speak with you. I really appreciate it.